I want to tell you a little bit about my family. I am one of seven kids. All of us have red hair. And as you can imagine, growing up in a family of seven kids, there's going to be a little bit of sibling rivalry, a little friendly or sometimes not so friendly competition. And as the second oldest of that family, I definitely contributed more than my fair share to the sibling bullying. This right here is a picture of my younger sister, Mariah. Um, we're a year and a half apart. And unfortunately, because of that closeness in age, Mariah received the bulk of my sibling tension. Um, growing up, I used to call her names. I kind of had a new, a new mean name that I would use for her every year. One year it was Pig. I called her Pig nonstop. One year I called her Child. Um, and I was just kind of a mean older sister. Would pull her hair, tease her, make fun of her. Um, by the time I got to college, of course we're best friends, right? Um, and it really hit me in college at one point how cruel I had been to her growing up and just how bad of a sister I had been. And I went to talk to her about it and basically just said, Mariah, I'm so sorry for this. Can you please forgive me for all those years? And Mariah's answer stunned me. She said, oh, Jane, I've already forgiven you. I forgave you every single day all along the way. The answer just stopped me cold. One, because I didn't even realize that it was possible for someone to be that forgiving and forgive that way, especially when the other person wasn't apologetic. Um, and second, I felt, and to this day still feel, so incredibly humbled that Mariah gave me the space to change and grow and gave our relationship the space to change and grow. And I want to contrast that story with an experience of one of my students when I was teaching in county jail. Um, this is, next slide, a picture of Anthony. Anthony was in his 20s when I met him. He was in jail on a, on a theft charge. And um, in one of my classes, we, we wrote our life stories. And in his, Anthony talked about an, a name that he had been given when he was young um, by his mother. His mother, every single day, called him the devil's spawn. She never used his name. She never called him Anthony. It was always the devil's spawn. Now, fast forward a few years, he was now in jail, and the same thing was happening. He had uh, a corrections officer who was in charge of his housing unit, who every time he saw Anthony would call him thief. Hey, there's the thief. How's it going, thief? Watch out, watch out. here comes the thief. Always, every day, day in, day out. In his essay, he talks about how demoralizing and crushing it is to be labeled and called something every single day that is not only just frankly evil, but also the exact opposite of everything that he wanted to be and who he knew he was. Now, I bring up these two contrasting stories to illustrate what I want to talk about today, and that is the importance of letting each other reset of giving each other the chance to start anew, to be fresh, to change, and to grow. And the criminal justice system is an arena that typically does not allow for much resetting. Um, what happens when you're in the justice system, you're pretty much in it for life. You get a mark on your record, and then that mark is going to stay with you for the rest of your days. And as we know, it makes it harder with that record to get a job, to find housing, to get credit, all sorts of things. And unfortunately, it doesn't just hurt you, but it affects generations after you. And in our country, we've developed a system that traps entire generations in a cycle of going back and forth from prison to poverty. We now have communities where young people are growing up actually expecting to spend time as a rite of passage in prison. It's especially affecting low-income communities of color. We've got um, one in three black men in this country who will spend time behind bars. It's just appalling. We are not creating those spaces in which we can reset. So what are our current approaches? What are we actually doing to address this cycle? We're doing some things. We're going into jails and prisons and teaching life skills or having some kind of addiction recovery program. We're also helping people on the back end as they reenter society, trying to help, help them with different supports. But recidivism rates haven't budged in 40 years. We see occasionally some success, but it's very inconsistent. And we still, to this day, have one-fourth of the world's prisoners here in America. Not much is happening. Now, we at the Reset Foundation are trying to do something dramatically different and create a real opportunity for people who are in the system to actually be able to reset. The idea is really simple. Instead of sending somebody to prison, 
a judge will send someone to our Reset Campus, which is entirely focused on helping somebody reset, helping them prepare to succeed and become community leaders when they leave. So it's pretty simple. The judge will send them to us. They have to apply. We accept them. They're then with us. They live on site. They spend all their time there for one to three years. And their day is packed with structured activities that help prepare them to succeed when they leave. There's three main programmatic areas that we focus on. Each person coming in receives a personalized program that, that is customized according to what they need. And it touches on three key pillars, academics, careers, and so, career, and social emotional supports. I'll just touch briefly on each of those. When it comes to academics, we found that oftentimes young men that are in jail didn't have a good experience when they were in school earlier. Oftentimes they went to traditional schools that didn't serve them well. And so we've had to re-engineer what the education looks like. Our work is very relevant, it's culturally sensitive, and the, the curriculum itself is interdisciplinary and very hands-on, very project-based. When it comes to careers, if we're interested in actually dismantling an intergenerational cycle, we can't just help them get jobs, but we need to prepare them for careers. And that's what we do. The entire environment on campus is oriented towards helping them build leadership skills, soft skills, other 21st century skills, so that they can compete in today's market. We provide them with on-campus jobs, and then over time, as they demonstrate responsibility and increased ability to take on new things, they start working in the community. And eventually we get them job shadowing opportunities, mentorships with professionals, internships, and then as they transition out, jobs in the community. On the wellness side, the social emotional supports, we have a breadth of supports for students that need them, whether it's a therapist, one-on-one -on -one counseling, group therapy, as well as leadership and life skills in, in a very rich curriculum for all students on campus. We just launched our first pilot program here in San Francisco. Um, we had a group of about 10 young men um, that we worked with closely over, over the last academic year. And we were excited that, uh, that, that we were able to get some good data. All of our students were able to get jobs. We also saw average reading levels increase over the course of just eight months by two years on average, with some students making up to, up to four years of, of reading progress in those eight months. We're now preparing to launch our site in the East Bay, um, our, our full model, in just a couple months here, and hoping that this will really serve as a demonstration point for the rest of the country that we can do things in a very different way and get much better outcomes, not just for the people that are involved, but for public safety, and one that is also much more cost effective and human. Now, how does the resetting actually take place in our students' lives? How does that actually happen? Resetting is a choice. And at Reset, we firmly believe that every human has the choice and ability and power to actually reset and change themselves. We don't pretend at Reset to change human lives. We know that all we can do is simply create the space in which others can make that choice to choose themselves. And we simultaneously recognize that we can't expect someone to reset when they've been called devil spawn every single day of their life and when they're trapped in a system that doesn't let them change. And that's why we have a reset campus. We have an incredible team of educators, counselors, and administrators that all firmly believe in the importance of resetting and who they themselves demonstrate in their lives the ability to reset, improve, and change. At Reset, we've learned that we have to model that ourselves. We have to model both as an organization and individually that we can do that. And so we regularly take time to take stock, reflect, shift, and get feedback. We've learned that we can't expect that from our students if we ourselves aren't doing it. Now, it's my hope today that we will be able to leave this room, all of us, yes, excited about resetting the justice system, but more importantly, also willing to look internally and to, to be willing to give others in our lives the chance to reset. As some of you guys know, the Pope was in America recently, and um, one, of his, one of his stops involved visiting a prison in Philadelphia. And I'd love to read to you some of the things that he shared with the people in prison there, because I really feel they apply to all of us. Life means getting our feet dirty from the dust-filled roads of life and history. 
All of us have something we need to be cleansed of or purified from. I am first among them. We must be saved from that lie that says no one can change. I just love that. Life means getting our feet dirty. It is impossible to go throughout this life without that happening. Part of being human is making mistakes, whether it's learning to walk as a child or learning a new language, learning to play a sport. Learning is inseparable from making mistakes. And if we aren't willing to give each other the chance to grow from those mistakes and to reset, then true learning is not going to occur, either individually or as a society. So one, it's my hope that in our interpersonal relationships, we will be willing to give those we love and those that we interact with the chance to reset, whether it's a spouse or a colleague or a neighbor, that will let them grow and will help them grow. My second hope is that we'll also be willing to think about this systemically, and that we'll think about what policies and practices, how we can actually create spaces that foster resetting and doing this in a deliberate and intentional way. And finally, I hope that we will all commit to prioritizing those moments of personal resetting, whether it's taking stock, reflecting ourselves on how we can improve and change, or even just a morning meditation or daily run, so that ultimately we can become the people that we were born to be. Thank you very much.